everybody, Brian here. From okay, so let's talk about some really important uh, developments of the last five years. Uh, I am writing my probably my third system, algorithmic trading system that will actually work properly because I'm choosing the programming languages of C++ and Python. I'll get to that in a minute in the breakdown of the use cases for each language. Um, but this is specific for high speed trading. Uh, when I'm saying high speed, I'm talking about a lot of anal analysis in real time before taking on trading decisions and hopefully using those trading decisions or trading signals to automatically execute trades, open up positions and close them with obviously risk management and all that built in. So let's rewind back uh, a few years. So, sorry about the ghetto, whatever here, um, but I want to say ghetto, ghetto pre presentation. Okay, so .NET, uh, we've got C Sharp included in this, and I've got a variety of code demos in my Quant Leap membership, and a lot of them work great. Uh, so if you're in the world of Windows prior to Windows 10, uh, they probably work for you pretty well. The problem is with Microsoft, specifically with Windows 10 now, I've had my first challenges when good old Microsoft decided to force me on to Windows 10. As a result, it was a complete, utter waste of my time, and the company has gotten so desperate now to force people onto Windows 10 from Windows 8, 7, even though they're happy with those versions, and they're falsifying uh, ways of forcing people to automatically update on top of having their home edition, all these forced updates that people don't want on their system because they don't know what they're putting on their um, system automatically by Microsoft and there's no control over that. So Microsoft pretty well botched that and this is why you can see here, this little logo here, the Apple logo, this is why I'm on this operating system because Microsoft thought that they were the only ones as an operating system and here we are on Apple. I've been now on them for pretty well six months. And I, have, I mean, I've had problems with Mac, but nowhere near the frustration I felt with Windows 10. So from there, anything Microsoft technical and software development, I just stay away from. It's just, it's a real mess. And when I look at Visual Studio, anything coming out of Office, Skype, uh, to be truthful, it, it's just, those applications are really, really bloated and nothing but problems. I mean, Skype's gotten down, gone downhill. Anyways, I don't want to go on about it. This is not an anti-Microsoft bashing video. So because of that, I guess you could say C Sharp will suffer as a result. And they're also trying to move people into or, or having .NET open up into Linux uh, with their mono project. I personally think it's going to flop and it has flopped because everyone would be on it. And Really, you want to stay native to that operating system. So if you want to stay Mac OS 10, you stay Mac OS 10. Linux, you stay uh, on Linux. And you're not really using these bridging technologies. So that has pretty well abolished .NET and C Sharp. Then we come into R. I've spent about eight, nine months in R. Um, it's a pretty good language for researching. and That's pretty well it. Uh, and the language is pretty well, uh, you can't really do a whole lot outside of R. I mean, you can bridge having C++ call R, an R script, which is kind of convenient, but compared to Python, you can do the same thing, but I'll get into Python in a minute. Also, R is a complete, really frustrating process because there's so many packages in R, you don't know which ones to use, and you gotta transfer this data type to that data type to work with that type of uh, package. And then there's compatibility problems between R3 and R2. And they just don't have a no code break policy, so all my R2 scripts are, I don't know if they work or not, and that's just due to the fact that these packages drop and deprecate a lot of functionality from a couple of years ago, which is pretty foolish if you ask me. And then we get into um, the kind of person that uses R. I find that R is, is only huge due to academia. Um, the academics are got a nice cushy job. They're not real traders. They're just 
researching. A lot of them are highly opinionated, and you don't get very far with having intelligent conversations with these people because they're not, from my experience, not real active traders. So that led me out of all those prototyping languages to MATLAB. Now, I love MATLAB, and I still love MATLAB to this day. A lot of things you could do with MATLAB was Simulink, cogeneration to C++, um, the M scripting language, and a lot of processes I came up with that worked great. The community is pretty good. There's a lot of decent uh, projects out there on MATLAB Central. A lot of them are free. Uh, and there's just a lot of great stuff coming out of MATLAB. The other thing I really like about MATLAB is the production server. I think it's very powerful. Um, there's also the uh, MuPad, which I really liked, uh, as well as the best capability. I haven't really kept up to date with where MATLAB is, but the MATLAB ability to embed .NET, Java, and uh, Python scripts and objects right in MATLAB is real nice, uh, specifically with a Python 2. And that's just a very powerful feature. So you can have all your extra code in one environment within MATLAB. The caveat, obviously, with MATLAB is very expensive. Now, when I was using MATLAB and heavily leveraging the power of it, I've got numerous complaints from my community because MATLAB's expensive. Nobody can afford it. So I hummed and hawed about it. And during that whole process was a major resistance to Python. I'll get into Python in a minute. And during that whole time, I've been using Java here and there. So let's get into Java. So I do like MATLAB. Give MATLAB a, a good couple of extra check marks. Java is a bizarre language. Um, it's been around since the early 90s. Uh, up until Java 6, I think Java was great. Once Oracle took over with Oracle uh, Java 7, I think Java was already going downhill but it really took off in terms of its descent into a coding hell. <laughs> and um, a lot of the Java developers, unfortunately, especially the framework developers and the big ones specifically, like to really over-engineer their packages. Um, there's so many features in there, it really bloats Java. It's, it is a complex language. And I'll address that again with the C++ side and C. And I think Java will probably come back with a resurgence once the Java 9 comes back, maybe. Um, but from what I've seen with Java versus Python, I can see why a lot of ex-Java and even MATLAB people have jumped into Python because it is it is a great language. And I'll again address Mat uh, Python in a bit. But Java is biggest caveat when it comes to automated trading is the garbage collection. No different than C sharp. That is going to dog you, and that's going to bite you in the ass because when you try to get into the lower level essence of Java, you are going to have real, real challenges ahead, and you really can't control what the garbage collection can do. Meaning, even though in the .NET you have some limitations on how much access of garbage collection you can have, and probably you could have the same in Java, I just don't think, if you don't have the absolute control on your memory objects, um, you're going to have a problem. This is when you get into lower latency, higher speed, a lot of parallel processing. So I can't really comment further than that, but... Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it in a little bit with uh, C++. Okay, so we've talked about MATLAB, we've talked about our Python, or sorry, MATLAB, uh, MATLAB, come on, oh, yeah, there we go. MATLAB, we've talked about, which is great, R, .NET, C Sharp, and, and Java. So, let's talk about Python. Now, as I said earlier, Python have resisted for many years. And when I started late last year in 2015, started looking at revisiting what high frequency trading shops are doing. And these are the big ones, the ones that you probably know about. And started looking at the job requirements in terms of skill sets that, that are needed. What I found was 
Python was one of them. And it wasn't just one or two shops using Python. It was all of them. And I didn't see as much Java. I didn't see as much .NET. I didn't see as much um, R. I didn't see R at all. And to be honest, uh, I did see a lot of Python. It was just it was just that standard. The other big factor I used Python with that thought of that of that uh, shift, the transition into Python, was the fact of my community wanted me to use something open source and free. So I thought about that and I said, okay, let's give it a shot late last year. So I moved into it. Everyone, a couple of people started freaking out. But for every person that was freaking out, I was probably getting five to ten times more people joining and visiting and, 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 and watching what I'm doing. And it grew. I won't even say it grew. It mushroomed. And it mushroomed fast. And that's another big factor. And of course, it's open source. It's free. So that's how that happened. And on top of it with Python, after working with it for now for for six months, I'll give you a couple of reasons of what, why I like Python. The beautiful thing about Python, because you're really only using three mainstream packages, uh, you are using Pandas, NumPy, and Matplotlib for numerical analysis, or which will lead obviously into trading research and trading itself. Uh, Python, because you're using only three packages, you don't have to worry about all these transitioning of data types like you do have in R. The other powerful thing is there's the debate between R up 2.7, let's say, and the three world. And what I'm finding is that I've stuck to 2.7 and chose that, where back then, a much higher percentage of people just stayed at 2.7. And I haven't had any real, real issues with it. Now, I'm sure once I move into three point whatever Python's at, um, I will probably run into numerous problems with my Python scripts breaking. So I recognize that, but I'm getting more comfortable with Python, but at some point I'll have, I will make that shift. Um, and that's beautiful. Now, the other thing, because you're only limited to three, or you're, you're allowing yourself to be limited to three mainstream uh, Python packages, your code is condensed from like what would take functionality of uh, 10, 20, 30 lines, and even in MATLAB you can reduce it down to maybe four or five lines within Python because the way those packages I mentioned are just how they're architected is very, very smart. And the community is so prolific that you could find a lot of ways to, as they call it, Pythonize your code. And it just, it allows you, because you can chain things in your code, like in Python, in Java, uh, your code becomes smaller and smaller the amount of lines you need and it becomes more and more convenient. And that's a big factor with Python, it's convenient. Not only that, as I said, it's open source, it's free. The community is pretty developed for pretty far along. And I don't get as much criticism with my ideas with Python, how I use it, as opposed to the, the world of R, um, who seem to be a lot more vocal. So, that's Python in itself, but there are a lot of caveats with Python. The biggest biggest two is you cannot execute trades with Python. Um, meaning you can't send out orders using this Pi IB. Uh, if you're using interactive brokers, I've had many, many reports that that package does not work. It's not compatible. Uh, with a lot of the latest features that come out with for the Trader Workstation. So that's not a smart way to do it. Now, that's fine. So now you have numerous choices if you decide to go with interactive brokers. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So with Python, that's the first big caveat is that you cannot execute trades with Python. Okay. Number two is uh, the if you're trying to build out a GUI based system like a graphical user interface for months for months I was not able to get around that 
And what I'm fa I was finding, I was like, oh, I'll use QT4, use QT Designer, and then it only works on QT4 because lo and behold, uh, the company that runs QT decided to drop that functionality in QT5. So like, you're like, what do you do now? So I read a book on QT and then QT5, and the only real options that you have with QT5 is either C++ or something called, uh, uh, what's it called, QT Quick, which is their GUI uh, visual uh, IDE area development environment. And that is built on their proprietary language called QML. And that was not a really smart choice. Um, and it's a no-go. So I thought, okay, I'll stay in the world of C++. When I started using Qt Creator, which is their IDE, and there were a lot of technical problems I had with these add-ins, and they kept breaking. It was a very fragile and weak IDE, Qt Creator. And then I fooled around with it. And again, I didn't have these problems on my Mac. And uh, when I started working with the interface, the GUI components, all the graphical user, I started realizing the big limitation was with it, and I was really excited at first. It's just, the problem with it was just, it was too constrictive, especially when you want to use a third-party uh, framework, like a popular one. Like in my case, I wanted to use uh, Redis, which is an OSQL database, and couldn't really get that code using their uh, high redis framework which is from the same author and founder of redis the project and i couldn't get it working within the confines of qt and the qt creator it just it was just wonky and it kept breaking and i was like this is crap <laughs> this is pure crap and i dropped it so about two weeks ago i started playing with a true open source uh GUI um, framework called at W. Let me just write this down so we get this WX widgets. And uh, that one was a challenge to set up a previous version. But they have at, at this current time WX widgets 3.01 and that's C. So I downloaded it, built, built, built the entire library locally on my system, both in Linux, both in, in Mac OS 10. It's a big library. It's about uh, a gig, so it's big. And they got some great um, interface uh, components to it. Had exactly what I was looking for in terms of layouts and uh, blah, blah, blah. Now, that's all fine and good, and I got it actually working. And I, as I said, I got it working both on my Mac and my Linux Ubuntu environments. So that was good. So the big real test was being able to integrate that true... Uh, which was true, open source, which is free again, into a database choice. So I looked at uh, Redis again with the high Redis and trying to integrate the C part into the C++ on the WX widgets. I couldn't get it working for whatever reason. Call me lazy, call me whatever. And I didn't really, at that point, care. And I was trying to do that both on Linux, Ubuntu, and the uh, Mac. So... That was a challenge. Now, the big issue I had was not just that combination with Redis and WX widgets. I was trying to figure out what is the proper IDE I should be using outside of Xcode on Mac <coughs> and other IDEs. So what happened there was uh, when I was playing with WX widgets, there was, there was about seven different IDEs available for Linux or for C++. And first I was using code blocks and code blocks is open source, but that kept crashing and just kept um, crapping out. So I dropped it. And uh, then I discovered code light and that was about a week ago. I've been playing with it in Ubuntu Linux, haven't had any real problems with it. And not only that, I was able to again, build the WX widgets be able to locally build the uh, WX widgets within that ID of code light. On top of that, there's something called WX Crafter, which is part of, or can be part of the code light IDE, which seems to be good and specific for uh, code light and WX widgets three. 
and it worked great. And I was able to build projects within the code like IDE, boom. And I was, I was like, awesome. But now the next challenge was, again, as I said earlier, was trying to combine it with the Redis and high Redis code. No go. So I tried the same thing about a week ago and I was able to get MongoDB working with it. So where I'm at right now is using MongoDB with WX widgets for the GUI part. So uh, a few days ago, I just wanted to confirm one last test before I really dive into this and put some real serious uh, investment into this. So the last test was to be able to find a way to have C++ call Python. Now, you got to remember, this is really important, really, really, really important. When you look at the power performance of R and Python, both languages are written in C. And there's a huge great effort on both languages to try and get both languages to perform at the same level as C. Now, from my perspective, that's kind of a bizarre way of trying to take something that's already built in C. So the question is, why aren't you using C itself and leveraging the convenience of Python? Doesn't make sense to me. So that's what I was thinking is like, why would you use Python as your primary language and, and calling C++ objects? And I thought that doesn't make sense because at least in the world of trading, you want a stable, environment. And as I said earlier with IB Pi, let me get that, make sure we get that noticed. Or Pi, IB Pi or Pi IB, one of the two. For interactive brokers with Python, the Python package. As I said, there's horrible, horrible, horrible uh, reports I'm getting on it. Nothing against the people behind it. Uh, I get it. It's an open source. They may not have time, whatever. But when you're trying to build a trading system off of this package, IB Pi, it's dangerous. It's a disaster. So this is where we need to segregate the differences between Java, C++, and Python. So finally, however long it took me to get here. What we need to understand is Python is great for scripting. Okay, really, really powerful, convenient. I've addressed that where you could do four thing, four lines with the three packages of uh, NumPy, uh, Pandas, and Matplotlib, okay? Those are powerful packages. So you can do a lot in those packages. Now, when I started testing C++ calling Python, not the other way, so basically what we're doing is we're taking a C++ program and embedding uh, the Python interpreter into the C++ program. I don't think that's very efficient. Maybe I'm, I could be wrong, but in C++ with Boost, there's a project called uh, Boost Python. So basically what that is, it enables you kind of conveniently to be able to call, using C++ call a Python script. Now, from my perspective, there's gonna be probably some limitations with that. Can you call within C++, call a function in Python and able to have that function access any of these three uh, packages. Yes or no? We don't know. What happens if you then update your Python with one of these packages? Can it break anywhere along? <coughs> Excuse me, along the way. <coughs> wow. Um, so those are big concerns. So. Here in Python, I don't think this is the smartest. Uh, I'm gonna use this thing called system. And that enables me to basically call out using C++ call system into whatever process in Linux, whatever the command line or terminal or whatever uh, functional I want. That could be a shell script, it could be R script, it could be anything. And that might not be the most intelligent way, but I can tell you this, I know if I do that, and call any of these. So let's say I use Python and I do Python and I call the Python script and I have hello world uh, Python and I run that from within my C++ program. Uh, here, this script in, in Python uh, will be able to 100%, without a doubt, call any of these packages. It could be any version. 
a Python as long as I can run it on the terminal and get that script running in Python, I'm good to go. Okay, but here's two options that I've discovered a few days ago. When you run the, the Python script, in your Python script, you're gonna have an exit code of zero, or maybe it could be an exit negative one of some kind of return. So when you run your Python script, you can check on your return or your response code uh, of that in your C. And you can just do something like if, this is again in C++, if you go if response equals zero or a better way to blah, 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 whatever, whatever you want, okay? Now, because of that, that's checking to see if the return code from the Python script, from the session of running the Python interpreter, was it, was it successful? Yes, do this, this logic. If not, do that logic. So you can control the response coming from Python, the interpreter, when you call it. All right, so that's kind of convenient. So that's one methodology I'm looking at. And not only that, but I've also demonstrated ways to watch a folder um, with files in it. So you can have your Python script create files, specifically CSV files, comma separate value files, or charts, PNGs, uh, JPEGs, whatever you want as a chart. And once it sees that, you can then quickly uh, load that up into a WX widgets interface, or you could use, Within your uh, C++, you could ha import the C++, sorry, you could you can import, the, again, from within your C++, you could import the comma separated value file that's generated by a Python script. Okay, so from there, you can generate your own data. Now, there's, there's a lot of really powerful things that you can do with this. So what I'm saying is, when you use C++ um, as a layer for now, depends on a number of things that you need to worry about for automated trading. I think the combination of C++ and Python are the most powerful combinations you get. I've already mentioned it earlier about how high frequency trading shops use this combination. Now, they could be using it for different reasons, but this is the difference in my mind in architecting this new trading system. Here, C++, we're using C++, the trading logic, Okay, so the trading logic will reside in my C++. I can also have uh, the C++ be used for my order, uh, let's call it OMS. Our order management system is done in C++. Now, when I get more sophisticated, for instance, I need to do fix, pro uh, fix the protocol, uh, Pretty well, you're limited to either Java or, or C++ anyways, so obviously that's an automatic with C++. Not only that, but I've shown two charting packages that are really, really powerful for uh, charting. Live charting is, is really limited. The only one I've seen that works, and you use Chart Director, which is very affordable and pretty, pretty good. For 150 bucks, Chart Director is a good answer. And if you want to do live charting, you can do it. But again, the only option you can do there is QT. <coughs> um, so there's that. Now, also for for uh, C++, there's another one that I've seen and demoed numerous times called Newplot. And it can do some pretty cool stuff for trading. So even if you want, you could use Newplot for your live trading. And you can do some very basic technical analysis indicators with a live chart using, again, Newplot. Um, and that's open source, it's free. So that's probably where you're gonna want to use uh, C++. Now, here's the key, trading logic. What do I mean by trading logic? So let's say if I have a very, very basic Python script. Now, for instance, I have a Python script. Uh, if you follow me in my course uh, that I've been running on the Algo Trading in Python course series, I covered a lot of these Python scripts. So what I'm looking at, let's just take one example on three separate functions or whatever it turns out to be. I can have a Python script that could do a variety of things in, in one Python script. I can have it download from a data source like Yahoo, free, cool. 
I have Yahoo from there um, build out some kind of, um, which would lead into some kind of data frame and then save that as a CSV, okay? Now, out of that, I could do some other things with that. Once I generate the CSV, again, I could have C++ take over once it's calling this Python script from within C++, as I've, I've talked about earlier. We could do it that way. Not only that, um, with Python, we could also use Python to do some very basic um, math, especially when it comes to matrices and vectors. And, and believe me, man, Python's awesome at it. It's just as good, probably even better than MATLAB. And MATLAB's king there. And R can be good. <laughs> but like I said, you want to use R for this package, and I want to download from the here. I've got to go through probably four packages to have the whole thing done in one process, in one R script. That's really inefficient, but with Python, you could probably do it in the three packages I've mentioned here, NumPy, Pandas, or Matplotlib. Um, so I could do some basic manipulation and easily keep it all within the data frame. And within one line, I could just generate a CSV from that data frame, pretty cool. Now at the same time, I could generate using Matplotlib some basic plots. Cool, right? And I could probably, within yeah, uh, Python, also do some general general uh, logic. Meaning, you know, if I have, let's say, uh, uh, a CSV, some data comes in, hits a certain metric or a certain threshold, do something, right? I could do that here in the Python. But those are trading rules. You can do it in, in Python, but I'm going to be honest, I think... I think you'd rather do it in C++. With C++, that's what I'm referring to, your trading rules and your trading logic. So I think it's better to do it in C++. I'm gonna address some further stuff in that. So this is where you use Python, I think. You could do download from a, a source like Yahoo, maybe even Quando, who knows. Keep everything within the data frame, okay? Or try to get whatever, whatever, whatever data into a data frame because then you can then generate CSV where your C++ could take over and have some trading logic or some set of trading rules within C++ that takes care of that. And then you could also generate plot uh, uh, charts from that as well using Matplotlib if you choose. But again, you could do the same thing here and using either of these charting packages, either with chart director or new plot. So this is the primary use I could see with Python. All right, so that's cool here. Now, there's two other things that C++ is really, really powerful at. First, we need to talk about C++ again for execution and parallelization. So again, for more um, execution or again, water management, actually I got it here. Um, we've got this here. Uh, uh, so C++ can easily handle that. And don't forget, you can also embed C Keep them, and I mentioned this in previous videos, keep C and its own separate class or treat it as a class from the C++ point of view. And probably a smart way to architect that. And the other thing where C, or specifically C++ is really good at is the parallelize. Now this is really important because no other language can really do it. I mean, Java is pretty good. Um, but this, this is a really important part of, if you once get into more of a high speed kind of trading system, so your execution, your order management uh, can get really seriously confusing here. If you choose to use fix, you're gonna do it with C++. That's pretty well standard. Probably not the smartest choice, but really when it comes down to it, it's probably your only choice unless you choose Java, because the question is how do you interface Java and C++? So, here with the execution, I've shown, let's again, if you're using interactive brokers and everything comes down, your limitations are really driven by your, your two primary sources, your data source for market data and, and your broker, okay? So we know that interactive brokers, uh, as it stands, supports uh, Java, C++, now, oh, actually, let me do this one, .NET, 
and C sharp, right? So we know the this one right here we've talked about earlier is a no-go. Uh, I don't think .NET, uh, I don't want to get into it. It's just, I, I don't know. I'm not going to, I've already addressed it. So C++ is the interesting one. There's, from the interactive pro. Uh, Interactive broker's perspective, there's Visual C++ and then there's POSIX uh, C++. This one's specific for Windows. Again, I'm not going to get into that tech flame war with Microsoft and Windows. And then there's a POSIX one, C++, that's really specific for POSIX-like uh, operating systems. And what we're talking about here are Mac OS X, which I've shown demos, seems to work okay and anything Linux. Okay, so this I would love to have more of um, with execution. But again, it depends upon your execution. For me, starting out, I'm going to stick with TWS. And really, uh, the most popular way to interface with TWS, and when I say TWS, I mean the Trader uh, Workstation. Okay, so Java is pretty well your number one option. Now, forget what I just said about Java for a minute. But Java, because this this application, the sample that you can get, is called the uh, we'll call it the uh, interactive test client, which is written in Java. Now, this is a really good resource to understand how to interface with Java on and on Windows operating system, Mac and Linux. And I've tested this, this works pretty good actually. This is where your execution will come into play, is using this tool and using this tool as well for your market data when you jump into a live trading environment with interactive brokers. This is the key tool. But again, the key there again is Java. So how do you connect your C++ with all this gizmo stuff with the Java, right? Um, well, you could use this as your base to, as I said, to understand how to work with interactive brokers. So from there, the problem is, is you need some kind of glue, right? Now, how do you do that? Well, you have zero MQ, which is a pretty good library for message queuing. That's what the MQ stands for. And it's totally open source. It's like Redis where it could talk to anything with so many different bindings for it. The problem with, at last time I checked, is there's no replication, no clustering, no replication. And if you choose to use 0MQ, you're going to run into a problem, a big problem. You have to write all this functionality for yourself. And do you really want to do that? That's why I chose to use something like Redis, uh, the NoSQL, because Redis is no is, is true, true, true open source, truly free, and it's a, an amazing database. Um, and the thing about uh, Redis is it can also be used for message queuing. Okay, and it also has built in out of the box using Redis Sentinel replication and clustering. Okay, so you, you don't have to put and blow your brains out. But guess what? I just did talk about Redis and interfacing it with up here. Um, uh, it's kind of confusing, but I've already addressed that here with WX widgets, and I couldn't really get it to work together. I'm sure I could, but again, I'm kind of lazy, and um, yeah, it's 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 a big deal. So. Can I use MongoDB NoSQL? Sure, why not? Um, MongoDB uh, will work with the project and I've got the samples in my code light um, working with WX widgets. So this and this works great together and you can also use Mongo or leverage the use of Mongo for uh, replication for clustering, and again, message queuing. That's the whole point of it, as well as using it as your repository or your 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 backstore for all your data, positions, 
uh, all your uh, market tick data, whatever market data, and whatever else you need, use Mongo. And again, Mongo is free. It's true open source, again. And I'll give you a little point of view. Um, if you have used this tool, Toad, it's a very, very good tool from the original uh, company, I can't remember the name of it, Quest Software, which Dell took over. And this is a great tool for using with Mongo. And uh, it's a good client as well, and it's free. So it's, that's pretty powerful in itself. So I think from my perspective, C++ uh, under these conditions and these rules work great. And calling Python uh, scripts, as I've already hinted. But there is a difference at this point. Now, I've talked about trading rules and trading logic, okay? So let's say you go into a lower latency uh, or ultra low, lower latency or uh, just a higher speed. I don't want to get into the marketing BS stuff. But I will say this. in uh, When you want to paralyze here and you want to do it at a low level, there's a couple of tricks we need to talk about. There's something called dynamic uh, class loading. And this is kind of old technology, but this is where the concepts of uh, dynamic link libraries came out of for Windows and .NET. And it's the same idea. So basically what you're doing is you compile a C++ class or even a C class, okay? And you have an object file and it's compiled. And you, what you could do is you could have another C++ program, call it, and then have it interface and dynamically loaded into that uh, program. Now, because you're doing it, it's already compiled, um, it's pretty fast. And you can use your trading rules right here in each separate class. So you have a trading rule, a trading strategy, some kind of indicator, but however you want to define it, you can do it as a separate class. And it could be done, again, in C or C++. And again, it's compiled. Or the other option is to do it through Python in under one of these scenarios, if you want. But the difference between this C++ dynamic class loading and Python and even R, this methodology can be 10 times faster, up to 10 times, five times faster than Python. There's some comparison uh, resources and postings I put up on my blog so you can find that. But generally, five times, 10 times the performance uh, using this methodology of dynamic class loading, that's pretty, pretty appealing. So if you've seen my fast flow playlist on YouTube, you, what you hear is going to find the highly intelligent architecture of this powerful, uh, powerful framework. And again, it's open source. Here you can set up workers, you can set up pipelines, you got all these different design patterns from within the framework. And guess what? You can dynamically load them into Fastflow. So you could separate each indicator, metric, whatever you're doing, keep it in C or C++, have it paralyzed in, in, in let's say a worker pattern, I can't remember the name of it, but each one can be run in parallel and at the end of it, have a, a, a combined response on some kind of event. And you can choose whatever your event will be and be able to maybe put on a position or, or reverse it. Very powerful combination. And again, the performance is five to 10 times faster than Python, calling a Python script, as I said, embedding it, or even faster than an R script. So. These are the different scenarios you want to run C++ uh, and run Python. But C++ is turning out to have a lot more um, capabilities than Python. Not, not like in Python, obviously, and I've already uh, talked a lot about the limitations of Python, but the combined uh, efforts of both C++ and Python are very, very powerful. But if you really want a fast training system, you want to make sure you, you code it up real smartly and efficiently in C++ or C using this dynamic class loading capability and possibly if you need parallelization using Fastflow. And then that comes up to the next question is how do the performance of something like with Fastflow dynamic class loading 
measure up against a hardware device like, let's say, a, uh, a FPGA board, let's say. I can't say. But I'll tell you this, that it's a much easier doing it virtually through software than a hardware, less proprietary, and um, it's going to be cheaper because you're not going to maybe not need this kind of hardware to get the comparable performance that you'd get with um, C++, let's just say, just arbitrarily or hypothetically, right? So there's that. I could go on beyond that uh, regarding the lower level uh, latency. Uh, if you want to address that, I could just mention a few um, highlights. We have BSD, and the other one we need to talk about there is uh, UDP. If that sounds right. Uh, okay, first UD UDP and Linux. There's a big difference between BSD and Linux. It, BSD is not Linux. It's Unix, or it's a Unix-like operating system. Linux is in its own world. It's a derivative of Unix. But it's just the convenient way of um, getting Linux with all the bells and whistles through a GUI instead of building it from source and doing it all on a terminal or a console. That's what Linux has, or that's where Linux has evolved. Um, and it's just a more convenient way from less low level uh, developers. But Usually, if you're using something like Ubuntu, which is fine, you're starting out, it's, that, I get that, it's easy, but you have so many different uh, flavors of Linux, and, you know, maybe one's the smarter way, more more efficient, more performant, uh, more secure. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, it's Linux, okay? So, when you're starting out, you got to work with a, probably an easier to use Operating uh, distribution or flavor of Linux, Ubuntu is probably the best. Um, but then when you start moving into a Linux like, you got FreeBSD or OpenBSD. And a lot of these are very low level. These are not meant for uh, newbies, not meant for I know JavaScript and I'm a great programmer kind of people. BSD is a very challenging operating system and it's usually where you're building your tools for BSD from source. So really, uh, con the convenience to run on BSD is one of three languages, Python, C, C++, and Java. Okay, I've tested this, but when you create your BSD uh, environment, be it on a virtual machine or on a physical box, you put in your BSD at the most basic uh, installation without all the crap that you most likely don't need. And if you stick to that, you've got a pretty slim and trim a lean and mean operating system uh, for, let's say, low-level, ultra-high frequency, high frequency, whatever you want to call it. And BSD is the option. But you got to remember, you're going to be using C++ and building everything from source using a compiler like GCC, new CC, um, in the world of BSD. Okay, so that is the difference between BSD and Linux. And when you start getting into your really low-level stuff, like, like socket programming and this other one called UDP, um, this is the, where you want to be, is in BSD, not a li not Linux, not Unix. Uh, you want to be in Unix, right? but the lighter version and the more pure Unix version is using BSD. That's it. No FNs or buts about that. Now, UDP is a different way, and now this is really only useful in the world of C and C++. Okay, so basically what this means is the ability to copy memory, okay, in the world of C, which I know, is uh, malloc and free, let's say. Those functions enable you to create blocks of memory, this is how much I need, and you need to destroy it. Whereas, as I mentioned earlier, with Java, C Sharp, uh, that's all taken care of for you. Uh, that's the garbage collection. Here you have to manage your own memory, and... It's challenging, you get memory leaks, I get all that, blah, 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 we get that. But it's per, that's higher performance. But the UDP is even better because I do know, and I've got confirmation from this, and I've got confirmations from, let's say, a VP at a large British bank, <laughs> um, where a lot of uh, HFT shops are using UDP to copy large chunks of memory. Like we're talking gigs of memory in like that. And it's faster than GC, uh, GPUs, and it's faster than FPGAs because they're not 
physically copying memory. All they're doing is just having a C++ program saying, here's the memory address of where this memory is, and it passes on to another C pro process to do something, and there's virtually no memory being transferred. So UDP is very quick. I mean, it's pretty, well, instant. Um, and it's, it's a trick used in C++. So all this GPU stuff, all this, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, FPGA stuff, this is where the true HFT shops play, is using UDP. And the funny thing is, when I was looking through the examples, they have UDP examples in WX widgets. Now, I wouldn't recommend it because this is going to be usually in a server program. Why would you load in uh, a large a large framework like WX widgets, of, like I said, one gig, into your uh, bin file or your executable equivalent? and just to do UDP. You are going to just use that on the command line as a command line console application. So you're not going to use that. But if you want to see how to do it somewhat, you can go through the examples here in the WX widgets for UDP. So that's pretty well what I've seen so far in terms of the lower level technology and how it's done um, overall. So we've covered a lot of ground, the different programming languages, the history, uh, when to use Python, under what circumstances, at least in my mind, moving forward, and as well as the C++ and when to use it. Now, it doesn't stop there. Um, as I advanced, and let's say I want to move into better execution, or more advanced, more like institutional-like execution, we'll need to look at Fix. And the one I'm looking at, and I know of, is Fix8. Open source, and they say it's just as fast. I can't say anything about that, but that's my best option instead of spending ooh, five, ten thousand dollars a month for a fix uh, library for an efficient one. Um, so fix eight may be an option. So pretty well that sums it up in what I'm how I'm architecting uh, moving forward the C++ and the Python. Um, I just wanted to put that out there as an overall uh, direction that I'm going and just thought process. So. Hopefully you've watched all of this, and if you have, congratulations, because you're a pretty driven person, if you ask me. Um, and hopefully, uh, if I directed you here, now you see where I'm going. Uh, and that's pretty well it, and I think we are done. Have a good day. Thanks for watching.